Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I join the Prime Minister in congratulating the new Usher of the Black Rod, and I'm really pleased it's a woman at last who's got that position. Uh, Mr Speaker, I hope the whole House... Mr Speaker, I hope the whole House will join me in sending solidarity following the atrocious suicide bombing which killed 50 people in eastern Nigeria. We should speak with sympathy for those that have lost loved ones and the obvious trauma they're all going through. Mr Speaker, the Irish Prime Minister, who has discussed Brexit with the British Government, says sometimes it doesn't seem like they've thought all this through. (laughs) So can the Prime Minister reassure him by clearly outlining the Government's policy on the Irish border? I'm glad that the Right Honourable Gentleman has welcomed the new Lady Usher of the Black Rod. Uh, I hope it isn't going to take 650 years before the Labour Party has a female leader. I, uh, on, the, on, the second, on, the, on the second issue... On the second issue that he raised, he referred to the issue of the attack that had taken place in eastern Nigeria, and of course, I'm sure the thoughts and condolences of the whole House are with those who have been affected by it. Now, he also asked me to outline our policy in relation to the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Well, I'm very happy to do so. I have done so on a number of occasions. We are very clear. We are very clear. First of all, that in relation to the movement of people, the common travel area will continue to uh, operate as it has done since 1923. And on trade and movement of goods and services across the border, uh, we will not see uh, a hard border being introduced. We've been very clear. We won't put physical infrastructure at the border. Mr Speaker, yesterday the Foreign Secretary said there can be no border, that would be unthinkable. Well, maybe, but they've had 17 months to come up with an answer to this question and there still is no answer to the question because they've not engaged with the negotiations properly. There's another person, Mr Speaker, who doesn't think the negotiations are going too well. And that's the Right Honourable Member for Wokingham, no. who was a very enthusiastic campaigner for Brexit, but also, he's a busy man, finds time also to be the chief global strategist for Charles Stanley Investments. And he recently advised clients to invest elsewhere as the UK is hitting the brakes. Prime Minister take advice from the member for Wokingham and does she agree with him? If I can address the first issue that the Right Honourable Gentleman raised, we have been engaging fully in the negotiations uh, in relation to Northern Ireland and other issues with the negotiations and indeed significant progress has been made. That's why, for example, I've said That's why I've said that we have got agreement on the operation of the common travel area for the future. He says we haven't put any ideas about the border uh, out. Well, I have to say to him, we actually published a paper back in the summer on the possible customs arrangements that could take place. We're, We're very happy. We're very happy to move to further detailed discussions of the customs and trading relationship we will have not just between Northern Ireland and the Republic, but between the United Kingdom and the European Union. Uh, That does mean moving on to phase two. And the question from the Right Honourable Gentleman is, if he thinks it's so important, why does his MEPs vote against it? Mr Speaker, the EU's chief negotiator said this week the UK financial sector will lose its current rights in the, to trade with Europe. It seems neither EU negotiators nor the government have any idea where this is going. Yeah. Last week, the Brexit Secretary said he would guarantee free movement for bankers post-Brexit. Are there any other groups to whom the Prime Minister believes freedom of movement should apply? Nurses? Doctors, teachers, scientists, agricultural workers, care workers, who? interested that the Right Honourable Gentleman has uh, found that his uh, appearances at Prime Minister's Question has been going so well he's had to borrow a question from the leader of the Liberal Democrats, which he asked me, 
which he, uh, which he asked me last week. Perhaps, perhaps the Leader of the Opposition should pay a little more attention to what happens in Prime Minister's questions. We have been absolutely clear that we will be introducing new immigration rules, and as we introduce those immigration rules, we will take account of the needs of the British economy in doing so. That is why my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, has asked the Migration Advisory Committee to advise, on, as they always do, on those areas where we need to pay particular attention to migration coming into the United Kingdom. Uh, we want to get on to deal with the question of the future trading relationship that we have with the European Union. But we also, I am also optimistic about the opportunities that will be available to this country and about the deal that we can get from the uh, negotiations we're having. The right honourable gentleman can't even decide whether he wants to be in the customs union, out of it, in the single market, out of it. He needs to get his own act together. Mr Speaker, the Brexit Secretary was confident the European Banking Authority would be staying in London. Now he can't even guarantee banks having a right to trade with Europe. Last week, the government voted down, the government voted down Labour's amendments to protect workers' rights. The Foreign Secretary has described employment regulation as, and I quote, backbreaking and repeatedly promised you, and I quote again, scrap the social chapter. Why won't she guarantee workers' rights, or does she agree with the Foreign Secretary on these matters? We have guaranteed workers' rights. We've introduced, we have introduced a bill in the House of Commons to guarantee workers' rights, and the Labour Party voted against it. Mr Speaker, the record is clear. This government voted down our amendment to protect workers' rights. The Environment Secretary, the Environment Secretary said he wanted a green Brexit. Yet again, Conservative MPs voted down Labour's amendments to guarantee environmental protection. On the 5th of December, Mr Speaker, the European Finance Minister's summit takes place to address the issue of tax dodging as exposed by the Paradise Papers. There are three proposals on the table. To blacklist tax havens like Bermuda, new transparency rules for tax intermediaries, and mandatory country-by-country -country reporting for profit. Will the Prime Minister back these proposals, or is she still threatening to turn Britain into a tax haven? I'll take no lectures from the Labour Party on dealing, on dealing with tax avoidance and tax evasion. £160 billion more taken as a result of action taken by Conservatives in government. 75 new measures to deal with tax avoidance and tax evasion. And I'm pleased to say, I'm pleased to say that recently HMRC won an important case on tax avoidance in the Supreme Court, which means a further £1 billion coming to the United Kingdom. He may talk about tax avoidance and tax evasion. It's this government that takes action and makes sure we collect it. Speaker, her predecessor blocked EU-wide proposals for a public register of trusts, and again the Conservative MPs have voted down Labour's amendments to deal with tax avoidance. Mr Speaker, when it comes to Brexit, this government is a shambles. Too many members are gesticulating on both sides of the House in a frenetic and frankly outlandish <laughs> fashion. Oh, I say to the Honourable Gentleman Member for Helian and Yah, he should oh, duh, he should seek to imitate the Zen like calm and statesmanship of the Father of the House. <laughs> In, I have much in common with Zen, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, 17 months. Uh, I understand, Mr. Speaker, the Tory whips are these days choreographing who to shout at who in the chamber. You're making a very bad job of it. <laughs> Mr. 
Mr Speaker, 17 months after the referendum, they say there can be no hard border but haven't worked out how. They say they'll protect workers' rights, then vote against it. They say they'll protect environmental rights, then vote against it. They promise action on tax avoidance, but vote against it time and time again. And, Mr Speaker, once again the Foreign Secretary offers his, his opinions, as does the Environment Secretary, saying there is insufficient energy going into these Brexit negotiations. You said it. You said it. Their words, Mr Speaker, not mine. Isn't the truth this government has no energy, no agreed plan and no strategy to deliver a good Brexit for Britain? Yeah. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, he talks about voting against tax avoidance measures. It was the Labour Party that refused to allow tax avoidance measures to go through in a bill before we call the general election. So he should look at his own record and he talks, he talks about people taking different opinions. I might remind him that on Monday in the bill, uh, perhaps the Shadow Chancellor would like to listen to this. Yes. On Monday, when we were putting through that important piece of legislation in relation to customs and taxation in Europe, 76 Labour MPs voted in a different lobby from his and his. In this, the party in this Commons that has no clue on Brexit is the Labour Party. But ache in and week out, the right honourable gentleman, week in and week out, the right honourable gentleman comes to this House and talks down our country and is pessimistic about our future. Well, let me tell him, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic about our future. I'm optimistic about the success we can make of Brexit. I'm optimistic about the well-paid jobs that will be created. I'm optimistic about the homes we will build. That's Conservatives building a Britain fit for the future. All, all he offers is a blast from the past. Yeah. Yeah. 